Welcome once again to the HWM YouTube channel. Uh, we naturally bring you all things Aston Martin and today we are back with our friends Akiri Batelli and Robert Blakemore who runs this wonderful business. Now we are talking Aston Martin pre-wars and Robert you've brought something rather beautiful with you today. Um, what model is this? So this is a model called the 1598. So okay. it was pretty much the last model made before the Second World War. Um, so the most advanced technically um, alongside the speed model. So as late as it gets pre-war, 1598, mm -hmm. as a modern car person, I'd instantly think that was a 1598cc car, but what does that actually stand for? Yeah, so uh, before the war, there was a calculation which was devised in the very early period of motoring, which uh, aimed to calculate the horsepower of an engine, and it worked on the bore stroke and number of cylinders and uh, a multiplier for those. Um, and that gave the 15 in this case, uh, and the government hung on to that formula even well past its um, usefulness to calculate horsepower as a tax measure. Um, and to show you how outdated it was, the actual horsepower is 98. So these two numbers were important pre-war. 15 was your tax bracket, 98 was the performance for the engine. Right, got it. So that must have influenced the way that quite a few engines of this era were designed? Yes, so the uh, way of lowering your tax um, was to have a small bore and a long stroke, which isn't really ideal for uh, high power, but what it does give you is lots of torque. Um, so a lot of pre-war British engines are very talky as a result of the current or the then tax policy of the government. So therefore you, you, you might say that it, so it's a 98 brake horsepower car but it's, it's really quite drivable and it feels quite healthy and muscular yes. at road speed. Absolutely, yes. yes. And looking at the body, I, I, I just love the lines of this body, I love yeah. the two-tone element to it. Um, Presumably it's still not particularly heavy. It's it, it's one of the heavier uh, pre-war cars, yeah. um, not helped by the uh, drophead coupe style. However, this particular car was restored um, some years ago, and instead of the steel wings, which were originally fitted, uh, they've been remade in aluminium. So it is actually lighter than it would have been when it left the factory. Um, it's probably just over a ton, about 1,200 kilos. So okay. For pre-war Astons, relatively heavy, but for pre-war cars and cars generally, actually, pretty light. Yes. And so, presumably, this comes from an era where I, 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 I've got to say, I've got to confess, I've never seen one in the metal before. There can't be many that were made. Well, yeah, not surprisingly, they built built 24 short chassis plus a long chassis version, um, and around 11 survive today. So 11. 11. Yeah. So if you want a rare car, even from production this is about as rare as it gets. And um, where does its roots come from in terms of the platform that it was based on? Um, the chassis is almost the same as a speed model. So 1936, Aston Martin um, revised its product lineup, produced the speed model and the 1598 together. Um, common chassis, whereas the speed model was intended really for racing and competition, the 1598 is the production version of that. Uh, very similar, same chassis apart from the rear spring length. The engine is the same uh, except this is a wet sump whereas the speed model is dry sump. And then uh, instead of uh, magnesium components, a lot of these are aluminium, uh, bought in brakes, bought in gearbox and a different diff. But fundamentally very, very similar to the speed. So I, I would guess in terms of performance, actually this, is, this, is, this provides for general usage and general events, a decent level of yeah, performance. Absolutely. Um, I shouldn't go there, but can you actually play with performance levels? Are there different yeah. things you could do to the car? Definitely. Because I know this is something that, that Curie Patelli get involved with. Yeah. Absolutely. So, the, like, like I said, you know, fundamentally the engine is the same as a speed model, yeah. which we can get 130 horsepower out of. So, and about 100. 10, 120 foot-pounds of torque. So if we were to rebuild this engine to speed model spec, we could significantly, so 30% extra power and uh, performance. So that would give top speed of around 90 miles an hour um, and you know, really good drivable um, vehicle, absolutely. Even as it is, it's good, um, but we could make it exceptional, absolutely. Got it. 
And then in terms of what sort of events and bits you could do with this car, because I, I always feel one of the wonderful things about pre-war events, and this is something that we will be covering on our channel again, is, is the kind of events you can do. And, and it just opens up a whole new world owning this kind of car. Yes. Um, it's clearly not a race car, it's a no. sporty GT road car, would you, would you say? Yep. Yes. Yep. So, uh, you, well, you could race one. Yes. Um, uh, maybe I wouldn't. I have raced the 1598 with a different body on in the past. Uh, in fact, we're at the weekend going to do the horseful uh, handicapped race uh, where any Aston is encouraged to take part. You could. It's not really designed for that. But uh, this would be ideal for uh, tours, rallies, or just touring and, and uh, as you said a GT car definitely. Well this is interesting so um, particularly if we have a look in the interior um, I mean it's actually it's beautifully appointed it, it looks far more comfortable and I, I, I must confess so Robert and I have have freshly come off the install rally and we'll be sharing a video with you but this I'm thinking back to our rainy day yes. in the car and this really is um, a more comfortable place, it looks it like, is. too. Yeah, definitely. So a comfortable place and uh, a hood, wind-up windows and uh, a windscreen so you would stay perfectly dry in this. Does it have such a thing as a heater? It, this one doesn't. We have fitted them to this type of car before, so we can fit a heater into into one of these, so yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's just me being battle-scarred from our, um, <laughs> our drive. <laughs> Um, yeah, but yeah, that's, that's a comfortable place to be in. It looks like it's got more luggage space behind the front seat, so you can put soft bags in there. It does. It also has something um, a bit quirky. It's got what's called a dicky seat in the back, um, which was a thing pre-war. I'm not sure of a post-war car. So the back actually opens up to create extra seating. Oh, yes. Um, so <laughs> if you've got somebody you don't like, um, you can sit them in the back here, or of course, if you're going on a very short journey, um, extra seating. But most people obviously don't use it for that. Um, you can use it as a luggage store, and Strap that's luggage. really yeah, it's uh, useful for. I mean, that that is the most antisocial piece of seating <laughs> I've ever seen in an automobile. Um, I love it. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic. Um, so this two-tone paint, do you think this would have been the original colour that it, the car was painted? No, it's not. It was originally a black car, yeah. um, which I think would look really fabulous. However, two-tone was a common um, style pre-war. So it's, although it's not the original colour, it is very much in the style of pre-war painting. And Aston Martin did quite often do two-tone, more so on drop-head coupe and saloon cars than on the sports cars. Um, and I think it's a stunning combination. And then my... Final question in terms of ownership prospect with something like this, maintenance wise and looking after one of these, are they are they horrendously high maintenance compared to a modern car? Um, no, uh, so a, an annual service for something like this would be about two and a half thousand pounds and you mm. would do that one uh, once a year yeah. or if you weren't using it very much every other year. Um, and that's what you could expect from a, a well-sorted car. Um, obviously, they, they are old and a bit like the fourth bridge. Quite often, there's always something else that needs uh, doing. Um, so you yeah. have to be prepared for an ongoing maintenance program. Um, but even so, you probably, on average, looking to maybe double that. So you're probably talking about, realistically, about £5,000 a year if you used it on a regular basis. Yes, that's fair. So as much as this car's beautiful with the roof up, it's got a really slick roof mechanism, hasn't it? Absolutely, just, yes. Shall we drop the roof? Just We'll just show how easy it is to drop it down. So literally two catches, super, super simple. Look at that. It's and it's such a pretty car now. And you can, of course, do that from the inside as well. You don't have to be outside the car. So you can sit in the car and just drop the hood or if it starts raining, pull it back up. So I absolutely had to have a sit in this beautiful drop head and um, it's a really comfortable cabin, but I, Robert, I can see a few interesting budgets, uh, buttons and gadgets. Yep. I mean, one in particular, if I may lead, is 
I could see it as I was getting in this down here. Now this isn't something I've ever seen uh, on a road car before. Wait, is, is that air venting? It is, yes. Yeah. So as well as being a good performing car, it was designed with comfort and uh, you know, in mind. And this is just to duct some cooler air into the cabin around your feet to keep you a bit cool. That's fantastic, it's a lovely detail. Uh, and I, I'm looking here at a switch that um, controls, controls the shock absorbers. I mean, yes. that's, that's pretty advanced stuff. Absolutely, so you can set harder or softer uh, damping, yep. depending on what roads you're driving on just like some of the modern cars. Beautifully yeah, very done. Advanced. Um, yeah. what, what about pedals and gearbox? So I, so I, I mean, I, as, a, as a lead into owning a, a pre-war car, I, 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 from my time with you, I've, you know, the, we, we've driven some cars with cent central throttles, some with particularly um, uh, tricky to learn gearboxes that you sort of really have to get into. Where does this fit in? Well, this is scheme. right at the, the best point to try pre-war motoring. Mm -hmm. um, this actually will drive much more like a 1950s car, something much more like a DB24. The pedals are uh, accelerator, brake and clutch, as you'd expect with a modern car. They're beautifully placed as well. It just feels yes. like you could rib match very easily. They're just to blip the throttle. And, yes. Yeah. And the gearbox is, uh, was bought in by Aston Martin from Moss, and it does have synchromesh mm -hmm. on second, third, and fourth. Um, it's not as good as modern synchromesh. Um, very similar gearbox to the Jaguar XK120. Um, so we would recommend that you still double the clutch, but um, as long as you're somewhere nearby, the synchromesh will do the rest for you. Very nice and easy. The brakes are Gerling rod brakes, extremely effective and the handling is uh, very similar to the speed model, so superb handling. I ideal first go at uh, driving a car like this. Yeah, I, I feel super comfortable. I think I'm, I'm ready for a long road trip already. So I'm still intrigued by this rear seat, um, the anti-social rear seat, so I've got to give it a go, get in and see what, what it feels like. Um, so you've clearly got to be very careful as you get in, tread on a spinner. This is gonna be the most inelegant entrance into a vehicle ever. I'll slide my leg under. Look at that. There we go. <laughs> I mean, it's advisable to skip legs day at the gym <laughs> to make sure that you fit in. But I mean, I think you said earlier, Robert, you could go down to the pub with your mates. Absolutely. Give them a lift back. And the beauty is if they've had a few pints and they've got to that stage where they're less desirable company, you can just pop up the hood and keep them keep outside of your cabin Definitely. and have a serene drive back <laughs> without them. How fantastic, sir. I love it. <laughs> so you will be pleased to know that I've managed to extricate myself from the back of this beautiful drop head. Um, Robert, thank you so much for bringing this car down to see us. Now, if you want more information, it is available on Acuri Batelli's website and we will leave a link at the bottom of this video. Thank you for watching.